For I want you to... Oh. Colossians 2, <coughs> chapter 2, verse 6 to 23. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanks thanksgiving. See, it, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made with without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its illegal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are, sh are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on ascetism and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his senseless mind and not holding fast to the head, but from the whole body, nor nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. According to, to human precepts and teachings, these have been, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in prompting self made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but there they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Okay. Uh, we are going to have our second Bible reading. Uh, this is going to be from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Uh, you'll find that on uh, page 917 in the Pew Bibles. As I say every week, I do encourage you to have the Bible open. It is a great way for us to read God's Word together. It also holds uh, whoever is up here accountable to God's Word, and I think that's really important. Um, so let's... Uh, let's read from chapter 2, verse 11 in Ephesians. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off from being, uh, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, uh, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. 
by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to, um, to you who were far off and peace to those who were, who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you were no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built, in the, uh, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Okay, so the last few weeks uh, we have been looking at what it means to be united with Christ uh, and how that shapes our lives. And in the first week I said that Colossians was a small book that packs a wallop. We have just gone through the first chapter uh, of the book of Colossians. How are you feeling? Paul has uh, laid an incredible foundation for the deity of Christ and the works of redemption and forgiveness. Uh, Paul created a beautiful image of Christ as the hidden treasure of wisdom and knowledge. And through him, we can grow to know God the Father. He revealed the mystery that had eluded uh, men for centuries. That is Christ in you and uh, you in Christ the summary of the gospel. And it, was, uh, and it was important for Paul to lay this foundation before he ended up getting to the problem of Colossians. Because chapter 2 really starts to take these heavy, hitting truths about Christ and God and apply it to the Colossians' lives and the trouble that they may be facing. So we are at a turning point in this letter where the focus is now going to be applying these truths that we've gone through for the last three weeks and see how it applies to everyday life. And so today, I'm going to tell you the four points I want you to leave home with today. Okay? The first one, we must walk with Christ. The second one, we have wisdom in Christ. Third, our identity is is in Christ and fourth we have freedom in Christ as we look at the first point we we must uh, that we must walk in Christ uh, we have to ask ourselves one question one question it's a question that Christine told me that I had to ask every time I'm faced with this very one thing why therefore is therefore there I'll say that again. Why therefore is therefore there? If you look at the start of our verse, in verse 6, Paul starts the sentence with a therefore. Maybe it's a great, it's a great question to ask, and I should maybe thank Christine every time I see it. Because a therefore summarizes and gives us the foundation or the conclusion to what came before. It is either a result of something or a reason for what was stated. But here's the thing. It is the main point Paul wants you to leave with and take away with what he had just laid down. So what does Paul want you to take from it? Let's look at verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. Paul wants to remind the Colossians that they have received the authentic gospel of Christ Jesus. Christ is Lord. Paul had already detailed what that means. And back in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. And if you received this authentic gospel that shows that Jesus is Lord, then your response is to then walk in him. And Paul has already spoken about what it looks like to walk in him. Christ. Uh, back in chapter 1, verse 10, when Paul prays for the Colossians to have the knowledge of spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to 
Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, that does sound like a really nice thing to do. So what does it look like in a believer's life? Well, Paul gives us four things or four characteristics of a Christian life that pleases God. First one, being rooted in Christ. So our Christian walk is to be planted in Christ. Our source of life, our nourishment comes from Christ himself. There is intimacy, a deep connection between us and Jesus. Number two, being built up in him. That is being built up in Christ. It is not only getting life from Jesus and remaining in one spot. It is a continued growth in our daily walk with Jesus. So uh, not only is our relationship with Christ growing, but it has an impact on our life. We are built on Christ, which shapes our desires. And we seek to know uh, and grow our roots deeper into Christ. I had a friend um, who was uh, discipled uh, by someone else. Uh, I I asked him uh, how his discipleship was going after a year of seeing this person. Uh, He said that uh, he was released from discipleship. Now, I had never heard of this before. Uh, And I think my puzzled face really gave that away. He tried to explain. Apparently... The person disciple in him said that he had reached a level of knowledge of Jesus that gave the stamp of approval as a Christian. There was no more he needed to know about Jesus. He made it. He reached the end. Well, <laughs> I've met a few people in my life and I could, I've never met someone who had completed his journey of the Christian life in such a short amount of time. I was honoured, I was privileged to be standing in the presence of such a remarkable man. I'm obviously being a little bit cheeky here. Uh, he is a great friend of mine uh, and I do, give him, uh, do enjoy ribbing him from time to time. Uh, but how do you think his faith ended up? If someone were to tell you that you made it, You've reached the end. There's no more that you need to do to grow, to deepen your relationship with Jesus. There's nothing else that needs to happen. Where do you think you would end up? If you guessed that he drifted away, you would be correct. His faith stagnated, and over time, his relationship with Christ became a little less important every every single day. What that person said to my friend was harmful. Our Christian walk is an ongoing process where uh, we are continually growing and knowing God more every day. There is no end point in this life. When we, uh, when we are building ourselves in Christ and, and doing so, deepening our, our roots go deeper and deeper as we know him more. And that leads us into point three. Uh, The third thing, uh, established in the faith. When we root and build in Christ, we become established in faith. The things that we are taught about the gospel become the necessary piece to our progression forward. Our path becomes more firm. It becomes more stable. We are reminded of the truths, when we are reminded of the truths regularly, uh, we are strengthened to persevere until the end. And here's a really interesting thing about these uh, points of characteristics of a Christian life that Paul labels. They are passive. That might not mean much to you, but this is what it means. These are things... God is doing within you. That's what it means by being passive. God is the one acting and doing these things within you. He is the one who is building you, uh, rooting you, and establishing you in Christ. 
Christian growth relies on God acting in your life. And in, in order to grow, we are dependent on him. So what does that mean? This is the fourth characteristic. Abounding in thanksgiving. The manner or the way uh, your life should be lived is a, is a life on, of an ongoing thankfulness. God roots, builds and establishes you in Christ and so therefore shapes the way that you walk your Christian life. We should be thankful for that. Without God's grace, this would be an impossible task. It should humble us to give thanks to God as we pursue Christ. All of this is all well and good. But what is the reason Paul seems to be repeating himself uh, in this section? He's just established all of this for the last quarter of the letter. We spent the last three weeks trying to uh, bring out what Paul is trying to do. So why could he just say this simple line to cover it all? Well, it comes in verse 8. It is to protect us from false teaching. This is the second thing I want you to take away from today. We have wisdom in Christ. When I was in high school, um, I don't know what it was like for you guys when you were in high school, but for me when I was in high school, the number one thing that they really tried to push on us was to go to uni. Uh, I had no desire to go to uni uh, at the time, but uh, my teacher one day, I remember, walked up to me and said, after we had an argument in the class, said, if you don't go to uni, you will fail at life. Those are quite harsh words. Um, funnily enough, I ended up working with her as a chaplain in the school, so... Yeah, so how's that? Um, the motivation at the time was that you go to uni for the sake of going to uni. And my thinking was, well, there's no point in spending four years of my life learning and doing study uh, when it was just going to be worthless in the end. It wouldn't have contributed anything to my life at the time. Yet, I was being pressured to go. This is, an, this is a similar experience for the Colossians. False teachers have come into the picture and are trying, pardon, excuse me, are trying to convince them to hold on to certain practices or to hold on to certain philosophies so that they, um, and if they don't hold on to these philosophies or practices, they weren't going to grow in wisdom or have divine experiences. Uh, basically, you won't be successful in your Christian walk unless you add these things to your life. What exactly are these things that Paul wants to address that are really important? Um, anyone's car? No? <laughs> yep, of course it's the elder, right? Um <laughs> So what, are, what exactly are the things Paul wants us to address? I don't know. No one knows. I'm not entirely sure. We get an idea of what it could possibly be in verse 16 and 18, if you want to check it there. Uh, it possibly has roots in Jewish practices and Greek worship. Um, but here's the thing. We don't really need to know exactly what Paul is addressing here. Because... Look at what Paul says, that how they contribute to the Christian life. They are empty, foolish, worthless deceptions. They're meaningless. <clears throat> so Paul gives a warning. This is a warning for even us today. Protect yourself from these things. They aren't from Christ. Now, <clears throat> these things aren't deceptive in themselves. I ended up going to uni. I ended up going to uni, and that's why I'm here today. 
Uh, Paul is a scholar, so he's studied for a long time. So not all philosophies and practices are to be rejected. Paul is warning against the teaching that rejected Christ as Lord, the one who uh, has su supremacy over all things, um, the sufficiency of Christ's work. All those things, these, these philosophies are rejecting. And Paul wants to really get across that Jesus is all you need. He's all you need to walk the Christian life. And Paul tells us why only Christ can lead us to live a Christian life. The whole deity dwells bodily in Christ. He is God. You have been filled by Christ. Christ alone brings true fulfillment. Three, Christ is head over all rule and authority. Remember what we spoke about a couple of weeks ago. Who is Christ? Christ is Lord over all creation. He is sustainer of all creation. He is head over all new creation. When we root and build ourselves in Christ, it not only shapes how we live, but also how we see ourselves. And Paul invites us to see just how full just how united you are in Christ. And that brings us into the third thing I want you to take today. Our identity is in Christ. Because we are united with him, Paul lets us know uh, that uh, what Christ experienced is placed on us through his redemptive work, which saves. So what I mean by that, uh, the first thing that you receive because of Christ's work is that you have a regenerated heart. Paul calls it a circumcision without hands, but it, it is a heart that has been regenerated. Paul explains that your heart um, is regenerated because of Jesus' flesh was stripped away by Christ's circumcision that is the cross. And perhaps you're probably thinking that, Adam, you have just made a very long bow to connect circumcision uh, with Jesus dying on the cross. Um, I would think, I would hope you would be thinking that. And there are differing interpretations for this verse. And I could tell you that I agree with those who suggest that the genitive should be understood as an objective genitive. And that, um, and, but that would just be boring for you guys. Only I find that to be interesting. Okay, so for those who are at growth group on Thursday, remember what I said when we're interpreting scripture. Does anyone remember who was there? Uh, what are the two things that we should do? Sorry? Check before and after. Check before and, after. and if we, that doesn't help us, what's the next thing we do? It's that scripture interprets scripture. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 13. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, uh, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Here Paul connects Jesus' death as a means by which spiritual circumcision is accomplished. Through, though Paul is a little bit more graphic in Colossians, I think. Just as circumcision stripped the flesh off of the males in the Old Testament, which identified the Jews as God's people and covenant holders, the punishment of the cross stripped the flesh from Jesus. In his act, our hearts were circumcised spiritually and now identify as God's people and covenant holders of the new covenant. This was the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. The Lord, or Yahweh, 
your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. Our hearts have been regenerated through Christ and we can truly love God for the first time. And here's the thing, and live. That's the whole point of what Paul's getting across here, is that life of living in him. Second thing that you get because of the work of Christ, you are transformed. You share with him in baptism. Now, if I was to ask you, um, in, you know, Jesus and baptism, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? I'm going to wager that the first thing that comes to mind with Jesus and baptism is the, when Jesus got baptised with John the Baptist. Paul doesn't go there. He goes to Jesus' death and resurrection as the connection to the baptism. Have you ever considered your baptism as being your death and resurrection? It's an idea of your old life dying and you taking the life that Christ offers, being resurrected into it. Now, if you've never experienced that or if you've never been baptised, let me encourage you to speak to me about that after the service. I think baptism is an important part of our unity with Christ and is an important part of our walk. Baptism is a sign of something that has happened within you. It's the thing that Christ is doing right now. It's that transformation. If you've never... uh, The third thing um, that he does is he made you alive with him. You are no longer dead. You have life because of the faith in Christ. You have had your sins forgiven, your debt cancelled, and legal demands removed. Remember the work that Christ has done for you in his death. What has he made you? Holy, blameless, and faultless. And all of these things, regeneration, transformation, and life, have been made possible because of the cross. Therefore, he disarms the rulers, as it says in verse 15, and put them to shame because they thought they defeated him through death. But it was his death that confirmed our victory. And this leads us into the fourth point. The fourth point I want you to take away today. We have freedom in Christ. Now, I I think you've noticed that there is another therefore. So we must ask that same question. Why therefore is therefore there? And I think verse uh, verse 20 to 23 lets us know exactly what Paul is thinking here. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations according to human precepts and teachings? These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. If, Paul, um, if what Paul has said is true, if everything that I've just said today is true, if you, see, you will see how worthless religious practices, philosophies, and human traditions are compared to what Christ offers those who are in him. What requirements they try to put and place on top of you, Christ has freed you from. So we too should take heed to the warning Paul gives to the Colossians. Do not let them judge you. Perhaps we should say, do not let them condemn you for not following Jewish practices. Uh, Paul reminds the Colossians that those were only pointing to Christ and now Christ has come and fulfilled those requirements. You are no longer bound. Today, that's not so much of a problem. I don't think we are running off to the temple anytime soon. There isn't one. But we do face something similar. My brother 
once told me uh, when we were talking about my faith and, and uh, my, uh, my belief in, in God and Jesus. Uh, he said that he would love to have what I had, but he wasn't good enough to have it. Unfortunately, that type of thinking has come from those within the church. You have to uphold certain practices in order to be good enough to warrant salvation. We call this legalism. And it is foreign to the gospel because in Christ we have grace. Now, it is good to follow what God has told us what is good. Uh, We should do good works. But these are things that will not save you. Only Christ can save you. So don't worry about condemnation. Do not let them disqualify you, he says. Uh, This really has the idea of reputation. Some may discredit you or place a bad reputation on you because you look rebellious compared to their standards. Asceticism. Not a word that is used very often. I could tell when Jacob was reading. He's never um, read that word before. Um, and that's, that's quite all right. But it's the idea of false humility. It may be a practice of subduing the body by extreme or harsh measures through discipline or self-humiliation. It is a wrongly directed humility. You are free in Christ. Your humility comes from Christ. It isn't what you do to the body, but what Christ has done for you. When you were an alien, hostile in mind and doing evil things against God, it is that undeserved grace that persuades you to turn from your pride And humble yourselves at the feet of Christ. At the time of Paul writing this, it can be probably understood that asceticism was a practice to experience divine visions in order to worship angels. And these false teachers would not stop talking about it. They'll go on and on about all these visions that they were having. Travel to heaven seems to be a continued practice today amongst false teachers, those who preach the prosperity gospel. Well, in order to legitimize their teaching or authority, they need to have some type of experience of going to heaven. One person who has rode the coattails for more than 30 years of his alleged trip uh, to heaven is prosperity preacher Jesse Duplantis. And today, you can still catch him telling his testimony of his trip to heaven. However, in the last 30 years, his trip seems to have evolved over time. He is no better than the false teachers in Colossians. He relies on his mystical experiences to give him authority. And Paul rejects these because they only puff up the pride in these people that doesn't come from Christ it is only in Christ that the church his body is nourished fed and sustained it is only in Christ that sinners can be knit together as one and all of this is because God grows us he roots us he builds us he establishes us in Christ that's why Paul says at the end of this passage that these things have no value in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. They are missing the point. It is not the body. It's our hearts. Christ gets to the center of the problem. Our hearts. He regenerates. He transforms and gives us life. And from this heart change, we are freed from the requirements or expectations that others claim we need to to meet in order to fix ourselves. Christ is all you need. Christ is your wisdom, your identity, and your freedom. Let me, like Paul, warn you. 
Avoid the religious performances that are a temptation for us in order to seem wise or righteous. That is a temptation that um, diminishes the sufficiency of Christ's work. Therefore, there's the therefore. This is what I want you to take from this. Continue to walk in Christ. Be rooted in him. Build yourself around him. Establish your faith in what you have learnt from the gospel. Christ is all you need. Let's pray.